to set aside the processes and proceedings which led to the said orders so as to avoid being seen as seeking to overthrow the 1992 constitution and or as merely subjecting itself to the advancement of a partisan political agenda on behalf of the representative of the political party, more so when the written process before the court had not been properly, had not properly involved in some of the court. Leadership. Indeed, paragraph 21. Impute scandal and a deliberate attempt to embark on a course which may be deemed to be a flagrant violation of the constitution. Why? To the court. Why? It's because the deponent's affidavit alleges that the legislative justice who preside over the court always knew that the supposed service of the first financial processes was made in breach of the provisions of, of the constitution. Um, Relationship, if Was in violation or the service was in violation of the constitution. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But for you to suggest that the chief justice always knew, even before the application was heard, that was in violation of the constitution, that with all respect imputes scandal to the court. I do not think it's proper. Again, paragraph 49 also indicates in very intemperate and offensive language that the first defendant expects the court to set aside the processes. Otherwise, it will be seen that the court is advancing a partisan political agenda. Thank you, respect. This is a very important, serious matter before the court. In my submission, there is no room at all for the use of language which unnecessarily scandalizes the court and seeks to impute that the court is advancing any partisan political agenda. Indeed, the whole of the affidavit, with all respect, is even a violation of the rules of court, argumentative and what have you. But that is not even my main contention. The whole of the affidavit is actually a violation of every rule governing affidavit. But my main concern is the use of the language in paragraphs 21 and 49, which imputes scandal to the court and which do not serve any purpose at all. I pray that these paragraphs be struck out. They get us straight. Right. Um, uh, hold, 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 hold on. Uh, hold on. Uh, Mr. Is your response to the matter raised? Yes, That's right. And I'm saying that respond to the matter raised. Yes, Thereafter, we will hear you on the issue of the panel. Mm -hmm. My lady, with regard to the objection, objection itself has been irregularly raised. Because this is essentially an application to the court to strike out specific paragraphs of the affidavit in opposition, in support of the application. This must come formally before the courts. And although the rules of the courts do not expressly say that, it should come by application. Several authorities of the court say that where the rules of the court do not expressly say something, then it's the rules of the high courts that should apply. And in the provisions of Order 81, Rule 2, it is clearly stated that if you have an objection to anything done as contrary to the rules. Rule 2 of CI 47, read it. So this is what it says, rule 2 and says this, an application may be brought, may be made by motion to set aside for irregularity any proceedings, any step taken in the proceedings, or any document, judgment, or order in it, and the grounds of it shall be stated in the notice of the application. And my lady, I just want to make a small point. May me. Yes, that's the point I was going to answer. May used in this context, as generally understood, is permissive. But may only means here that the party alleging the irregularity can waive it it is in the sense as it was explained in edusei 
versus Attorney General, the 1998-1999 reported version, in which the question was raised whether the word may used in Article 33, 5 of the 1992 Constitution meant that a person whose human rights are violated may decide, may apply. And they said the way the may there doesn't mean that you can decide to come by any mode. It even means that you can waive your fundamental human rights. But if you want to take the objection, you must come by application. That's my first answer. Secondly, I'll deal with the substance itself. Secondly, I'll deal with the substance. It is argued that the, way, the, 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 the paragraph 21 of the affidavit in support is scandalous. Now, the word scandalous is just used. And I'm saying read the whole, reading of the whole of the affidavit would disclose the context of that particular paragraph. I have referred to an Exhibit D, which is the foundation of those depositions. The Exhibit D is a letter emanating from the judicial service, in which they make reference to discussions held between my lady, the Chief Justice, and the first defendant on potential breaches. So if I make that deposition, I make it based on that one. And apart from that, okay. yes. Hold on. Your so judicial service. Hold on. Yes. The points you read, you just so go on. Yeah. In, in that particular exhibit, it is clear what the directive of my lady, the Chief Justice, was clear. And so, I'm saying, and if I say that at all times material, it was always within the knowledge of my lady, I am making it based on that. And, and if my lady reads exhibit D, it says clearly that the Honorable Chief Just, Just, uh, Lady Chief Justice's attention has been drawn by the right Honorable Speaker. This is all based on that. It's a statement of fact. Please, 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 just get on. Very well. Then he talks about. And leave the commentary. Oh, my lady, it's a submission. This is not a commentary. All right, With all due go respect. on. Go on. Yes. In, in paragraph 49, he says that the deposition that the first defendant also expects the court to set aside the processes and proceedings which led to oh, the you uh, complete the reading of paragraph of um, SBD, if you want to. No, um, my, my lady, you said the point was made and I was very into it. There Yes, so I'll, okay. I'll, I'll do it. So, the basis of paragraph 49 Yes, my paragraph 49 arises from the observations made by the court before its ruling on the basis of which it made the orders. And your paragraph 49 is premised on observations by the court made in, in the, the course of its ruling in the ruling of 18th, 18th of October. October, which is sought to be set aside in this application. In the fourth page of the ruling of the court, starting from the third paragraph. Attached as. Yes. Attached as. As B. There is a finding by the court that the applicant, or the, 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 the court observes that the applicant urges, and we appreciate that the said ruling would also likely lead to alleged thwarting of government business in parliament and plunge the due management of the affairs of the country into possible disruptions and so the court then on the basis of that makes its ruling in exhibit a and moves that no hold on point also, yes. hold on yes. so the partisan polit political um aspersions yes. arise from the observation of the court on the Submission of the applicant yes. in, that, in that time. Yes, my lord. At that time. Yes, my lord. Because in the ruling of the court, if my lady looks at the second page of the ruling of the court, I think if we start from the court makes the same observation. Exhibit A. Exhibit A is not the ruling of the court. No. The, my, 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 my lord, those, those points of 
portions of the submissions that were made to the court were relevant and that informed the ruling. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yes. No, those were the proceedings. Yes. Mr. Sorry, yes. so what is it is the not, uh, your, court is speaking, it is not please the ruling hold of your gun. So, just uh, refer us to the proper exhibit, yeah, my, my which part. contains the ruling of yeah, So I started from the proceedings, and I'm now ending with the, the other. The other also made, the, the other just makes the same finding. If my, if my lawyers take a look at the, um, the paragraph that says the applicant edges the court. Where are you reading from? Uh, uh, the, the, after listing the, uh, the, the, the parliamentarians affected by the ruling, there's, uh, the next paragraph which starts with the, uh, the set for constituencies, and then it goes on to say the applicant edges, and we appreciate that the ruling. The so you are reading from SBB. B. No, just check A. The order that was sent. Is it three? Yes. Yes. The cover, the, 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 uh, the, the cover letter is, uh, uh, is, is, is marked E, but the attached to it is then the order of the court. Mm -hmm. And so that was, yes, that was taken into account before the court then makes the extensive orders relating to even four parliamentarians when the writ itself affected three parliamentarians. It didn't even include Article 97, one each. And so all of those orders were made based on some of those findings. And I'm saying that, and, and the position is that the first defendant, based on these things, expects that in order not, especially when the court reaches the conclusion, say, the conclusion that on the balance, there was no balance. There was just one side of, of, of it because it was an ex parte application and they were ahead. What was the balancing? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I thought you were just responding to a very straightforward Oh, yes. This thing. But now it appears that you are veering into the substance of the motion itself. No, 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 no. I, would, I would urge you rather, to restrict yourself to the objection that he raised and answer it whether it is scandalous or it's not scandalous. It is not scandalous. My, my problem is yes, if um, your learned friend on the other side has raised these matters and you think it's not scandalous, you don't have to, as it were now, veer into the substance um, of the application itself. My Lord, I needed to demonstrate that these things were not just said out of any... No, just restrict yourself oh, to... My, my Lord, that's a good I thought yes. I, was, I was doing that. Yes. And so, as far as I'm concerned, apart from the use of the word scandalous, which he just used. He doesn't demonstrate how scandalous it is based on the context of the application that I have before the court. You allege that the chief justice is privy to a breach yes. of a constitutional provision. Yes. What are you trying to convey? It may have been by reason of inadvertence. But, uh, but if that is a statement yeah. of fact, and, 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 should it and be was, made? It, was it necessary for you to add that in, 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 your, in, your, in your depositions for you? What, what, what exactly were, were you trying to achieve? By adding the, adding, adding, adding the point that the chief justice was privy to a constitutional breach. I think that's the point he was. Oh, yes, but, but the point is that if she was privy to it, her ruling must reflect that. If it doesn't, it's one of the grounds upon which I'm urging the court to set it aside. But, Mr. Sorry, the ruling, if you don't mind, let me draw your attention to the fact that. The ruling says that if you look at the first page of SB A, we note we note from SB B the official report on the parliamentary debates on Thursday, 17th October 2024. Pages 15, 16, and 17, that the Speaker of Parliament was aware that bailiffs of the Supreme Court had served the current action on him yes. through the legal office of Parliament. Yes. His objection to this proper service of a process from the Supreme Court was that it had not been done on a Monday. Yes, my lady. That's what the ruling says. So, the, I, uh, hold on, please. Ahead. So the ruling was quite clear. The source of, of, of the notification. Yes, my lady. But that was, if that's even the source. If, if oh, I could learn. Sorry, I thought my lady had finished. I'm very sorry. I thought my lady had finished. I'm honestly sorry. Yes. Yeah. 
I... So the ruling yes. was quite clear yes. about the source yes. of the observation that the Speaker of Parliament had been properly served. And, and the ruling appreciated the secular, administrative secular, from the Chief Justice. The first Chief Justice was uh, Chief Justice Edinia Boa in 2021, and, the sec and myself issued another secular, which clarified how all of Parliament was to be served. That is what you are referring to. Is yeah. that not so? Yes, my lady. And, and how does that veer into a partisan political agenda, yeah. uh, including constitutional breach, breaches? The two are independent. Let me deal with the first one. My lady says, uh, the finding even by the court that it was proper service is, is the point we are making. That by reference even to the parliamentary proceedings that took place that day, it was clear. It is not, first of all, it's not the official report because it was just a draft one. Parliament had not yet... Gone, gone through it and adopted it as an official one minute. That, so that, that's, but the second thing is that the court could not have found so found without referring to the judicial circular in which the proceedings have indicated clearly that the first defendant was objecting that it was not in accordance with that and the plaintiff what, what? appreciated it so that, that, is, that is it and this other with regard to the partisan aspect of it it was it, it, that one is distinct it's a distinct point and that one is based on the submissions made to the court that, based on the assumption that if one party is the majority, it is deemed that government business will be thwarted. That was, is, that's based on that assumption. Because if the, if the speaker's ruling stayed, then there was nothing to show that whichever party was the majority or otherwise, government business will be thwarted. And the constitution doesn't assume that the government in power would necessarily have majority in parliament. So. Those were the issues that, that we raised clearly on the face of the documentation. Are we still addressing the preliminary um, legal objection raised uh, by the attorney general? Oh, yes, or we are dealing with questions. a substantive matter, i.e. your motion to set aside the protest. Oh no, I'm dealing with that, that matter, but I'm also responding to questions from the bench, showing why, if, 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 if my lady says that it was based on the, 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 the proceedings of, in Parliament, I'm asking uh, kindly, that. Kindly round up. Yes, so, so my, my lady, there's nothing scandalous about it. They are based on matters of fact that arose, that arose out of the proceedings before the court on the basis of which the court made the orders sought to be set aside. Yes, my lady. Yes, my friend. And accuse that member of being, when the decision that is taken here is a collective decision by the You isolate one member in your position and accuse that member of being privy to a constitutional yes. You think that it's a proper thing for us to make? Well, first of all, it's not a proper inference from the affidavit because the person who's judicial, sec uh, I mean, the, the judicial uh, secular does not make reference to the full membership of the panel. Oh, yes. Yes, because she was named in the secular. The rest of the panel was not named there. Uh, yes, but I'm giving the background to, to that application. Uh, well, I'm not accusing. And, and, to turn it, and to turn it into an accusation, it's not a fair inference to be drawn from the affidavit. Well, uh, maybe my lord is borrowing his words, and then I'm, I, I have to answer. I'm sorry, are you able to allow the court to tell you something? Oh. If the proper practice at the bar is when the judge starts speaking, you stop. Do you not appreciate that? Oh, my, my lady, I, I don't think my, my lord thought I interrupted him. I was just responding. I beg your pardon. Then you, then you oh. shall, then you shall, you shall. Is, is, is a proper, I, I don't see it. Oh. Um, my, my, my lord, I, I don't Are you think... able to let my lord land before you start speaking? So we can have an orderly contact for today's present. So that's my lawyer. I'm scared. I'm going to talk to you. I don't think you can talk to me. I saw it from you. That's the only question from you. That's the problem. It is actually the decision. I'm going to talk to you. My, 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 my lord. 
So, but I'm saying that it's not a fair inference from the, 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 the affidavit, and, 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 and with all due respect, they, we refer to a circular that had nothing to do with the panel. And so it wouldn't have been right, I would have been misrepresenting the circular if I put it in those terms. Yes, can, can, Mr. Abedu, can we hear you on this preliminary point? He's done, he's done. No, 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 but is he done? But yes, he's done. <coughs> of the president arises from some so of that the... My Lord, on the stream, what? Right to my lady, the Chief Justice. To him being impaneled in this matter arises from the fact that at a point in time, he was known to be associated with the New Patriotic Party. And in fact, he was a parliamentary candidate in one of their constituencies in the Volta region. I think you've said enough. Very well. And mm, uh, yes. I just want to demonstrate from, especially again. No, I think you've said enough. From the I think you've proceedings said, and the No, opening. I think you've said enough. Kindly resume your seat. Very well, my lady. Let's go. of this court. Oh, you have to call the case, huh? Very well. Respecting my civil motion number J1-01-2025, Alexander Afenyo Markin versus the Speaker of the Attorney General. See you to a call. Preliminary objections raised to paragraphs 21 and 49 of applicants' affidavit will be addressed in the final ruling on this application. On the objection to a panel member being a former member of a political party, this court must take judicial notice of the fact that within the ranks of the superior courts, is a former member of parliament for the National Democratic Congress, a former general secretary of the People's National Convention. It should be well understood that when parliament approves a qualified citizen to be a justice of the superior courts, pursuant to Article 1284, the representatives of this country have appreciated the ability of that qualified person to contribute to justice delivery in the country. Second, the subject matter of this suit before this court is a constitutional dispute and not a matter involving political parties. The objection is therefore misconceived. Move your application and dismiss. We have before the courts, the courts are not, um, they them. 
But it's important to state right from the outset that they concede the, the fact that the processes were filed contrary to the rules of the courts. But all they are saying in the affidavit of the position is that the court is capable of caring, not by reference to Rule 79 of the rules of the court, but of Order 81 of the High Court rules. Well, we are saying that that irregularity is incurable, and this court has re-emphasized that in very recent cases in this court. My Lord, I refer just to two cases. The case of Mahama Yarga, an attorney general, rate number one, J1, slash 13, slash 2022, dated 29th March 2022. There's also the case of Ken Kranchi versus Attorney General, rate number J1, slash 16, slash 2023. Ruling of the court dated 14th November 2023. All these were writs which invoked the original jurisdiction of the court to interpret the constitution. This court held that a violation of the rules nullified the proceedings. We also want to emphasize that by the decision of this court in the case of National Investment Bank number one, there's a standard offshore trust company number one, reported in the 2017 Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report at page 707, the court held that where the provisions in the rules of court use the word shall, it is mandatory and should be enforced. We urge the court to follow these decisions. We should also add that where the irregularity complained about, complained about arises from originating proceedings, like in this particular matter, the court has also been consistent that such irregularities cannot be cured. So, several reasons why, in which recently the court has made the point, nullifying the rates. Secondly, the rules are mandatory, and the courts and this same court says that when they are mandatory, they will be enforced. And finally, where the proceedings are originating in nature. There can be no waiver. There can be no waiver. But that's the recent position of the court. All I was saying also that even if it were curable, which it is not, the court's jurisdiction, substantive jurisdiction, to entertain the matter as a whole was not properly invoked. It was not, it, 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 it was not properly invoked because the court lacked jurisdiction to, to entertain the matter as a matter, the purpose of which is to determine whether or not the seat of a member of parliament is vacant. That matter belongs exclusively to the jurisdiction of the high court. And this court has affirmed that consistently, not deviated in one, that if it has to do with the membership of a person in parliament, that belongs in the realm of the high court, not this court. But I would want to emphasize the point that, admittedly, in every instance, they would say that the facts on the basis of which they are before this court arise. There will be a dispute between two people regarding whether or not the person properly is a member of parliament or not. And that has to be determined by reference to the constitutional provisions. It won't make it a dispute properly invoking the original jurisdiction of the court. What I'm saying is that wherever the question arises, as to whether or not a person is properly a member of parliament, whether he ceases to be or he sees, I mean, his, his seat is vacant, there will be disputing positions, there will be differing positions. But the constitution says it's the high court that must determine that matter. 
And in this particular instance, the question is whether the parliamentarians who are the subject of the instant suit, their seats have become vacant. And the constitution clarifies the position by telling the High Court the instances in which those seats will be deemed vacant. And it is a cross carpeting situation. So it's a matter of evidence for the High Court to go into and find out whether the facts establishing those circumstances in Article 97 have arisen or not. It's not a question of interpretation. The court had no jurisdiction to stay execution of the ruling of the first defendant. And that one, three main points will deal with that. First of all, the substantive suit before the court never challenged the ruling of the speaker. The, the suit before the court had nothing whatsoever to do with the ruling of the speaker. Interlocutory reliefs made by any court of the land relates to the substantive dispute before the court. That dispute was never before the court. And so once the dispute was not before the court, the court didn't even have jurisdiction to make an interlocutory relief in respect of that ruling. Secondly, the High Court's ruling, uh, the, 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 the first defendant's ruling, is not a judicial decision which is properly the type of order or ruling which is the subject of the court's orders for stay of execution. At the very best, it's an administrative decision. It's not a judicial, it was not based on any judicial determination of any matter. Linked to that fact is the trite position that when we say stay of execution, we don't say it as a semantic expression by way of semantics. It is based on the rules of the court. It's a statutory position that certain matters are liable to be progressed by way of what the law says, execution. And the law defines how to execute things. Not from anywhere, but from the judgment of courts. The speaker's ruling is not one of them. The speaker's ruling is not executable. It's not executable within the meaning of the rules that govern the practice before this court and any other court for that matter. That's, that's just third round. In the fourth round, is that the processes, the, 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 the processes initiated for purposes of the order, the ex parte application, was made in breach of the rules of natural justice. And this arises from a plain reading of the rules of the High Court which provide for applications, because the rules in this court don't provide extensively for uh, uh, applications. I will refer to order 19 of the rules of the High Court. Which say clearly that every application must be made on notice. That's the first rule. There is an exception which allows for ex parte applications. Our submission is that. The, the, the rule, rule, uh, rule 3 of what 19 talks about ex parte applications and it says subject to rule 1, sub rule 3. 
that's of order 1903, an application by motion may be made ex parte where any of the rules provides, or where having regard to circumstances, the court considers it, considers it proper to permit the application to be made. Now that's all, we should read the, the sub rules in context. The court may make an order ex parte on such terms and subject to such undertakings as it considers just, where it is satisfied that the delay caused by proceeding in the ordinary way would or might entail irreparable damage or serious mischief. Now, my lord, we are dealing with a plaintiff who has demonstrated that he's capable of getting the court to sit at very short hours. Mm. He files his ex parte application at 12.40. He gets a panel of the court to sit at 2. Our submission is that he should have made it on notice together with an motion for abatement of time. There was an intervening Monday before parliament would next sit. And the first defender would at least have been given an opportunity on that Monday, however short it is to make representations record on the grounds and basis for that application. And so that's the reason why we contend that the application itself did not properly come within the exception to the rule that he should have come on notice. Because it was always possible, given the, the facts of this case. On the basis of that, we further contend that the order of the court was also made in breach of the rules of natural justice. Because when it came before the court, within an hour and a half or so after it was filed, the court could have directed that the first defendant be put on notice to be heard on the coming Monday so that the facts will be properly put before the court to enable the court to reach a proper conclusion. We further submit also on another ground that the rules of court and practice did not permit the type of order that was given by the court. Bearing in mind the first rule again as was expressed by the court in Barclays Bank and Ghana Cable, that ex parte, bear in mind the principles laid down by the court itself, that in the case of Barclays Bank and Ghana Cable, 1998-99, Supreme Court at page one, that ex parte applications and orders that flow from them are anomalies in our system. And in that particular case, the court emphasized that no ex parte order should be given pending the final determination of a matter. But that is what the court did in this particular instance. In fact, it's contrary to the rules of practice and the established decision of this court in Barclays Bank versus Ghana Cable. And we've also already made the point that since the, 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 the ruling of the speaker was not the matter that was before the court, the court couldn't have made an interlocutory order on the basis of the suit that was before the court. There was nothing before the court. Now we also note from the order that there was an application for just for stay of execution of the ruling of the court based on the rates that was filed before the court. And if my lords will give of the court to take a look at the reliefs that were sought by the plaintiff, we realize that three members of parliament were listed. Hold on. Yes. When the rate is examined, it's, it's, uh, examined. it mentions three members three of parliament. Three members of parliament. The first of which is Honorable Andrew Asiamwa Amwako, who is now going to contest from the position of an MPP parliamentary candidate, no, from the position of an independent to MPP parliamentary candidate. His situation will be covered by Article 97 1H of the 1992 Constitution. The reliefs that I see do not mention Article 97 1H of the Constitution in the first relief. So, 
an issue of interpretation is not sought for in respect of that particular belief. This is your submission. Yes. This is your view. That's yes. yes. Then, my loss will also realize that the reliefs don't cover honorable I've Peter. been alerted that you spent 16 minutes. Oh, really? <laughs> I'll be winding up, my lady. I'm, I'm sorry. They, 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 they would realize that the reliefs cover the honorable Peter, uh, Peter Yao Kwachi Aka, the NDC MP. You know, do not cover him. The reliefs of the substantive rate do not cover him. But the application covers him and the orders covered him. So, on that ground, we say, even the orders ex 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 exceeded the scope of the application and the nature of the suit. The, hold on. The scope of the application or the scope of the relief? The scope of the relief sought in the substantive... Uh, the substantive uh, 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 action. Uh -huh. Yes. And, and, on, and, and because it exceeded that, the application could not have been in respect of, of, of those, uh, the, the substantive suit. Unless we finally submit that because this matter was brought ex party, the balance of convenience was not properly employed by the court, which is a ground upon which the court made this decision because of the fact that allegations were made about what was likely to happen in Parliament. And there was no foundation whatsoever for it. And so the cost uh, 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 jurisdiction wasn't properly invoked, especially in respect of Articles 1913, which requires a fair year as a constitutional right to be accorded to every person, and the provisions of 296A and B, which uh, 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 require the courts to um, discretion. discretion in a particular manner. So we pray that there was every opportunity, and, 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 and the, the first panel would, would want to be heard on, on that. And for, just before I sit down, the hands that was relied on, as we said, was not the official hands up. And I will pray accordingly. Not, 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 not so. <laughs> not, not at all. I, 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 well, there are members of parliament, if they come in, can get up and say it is official, it's fine. They are. Do it with me. Any such invocation shall be commenced by a writ and not an originating motion. And we were accordingly guided. The rule further provides at order 46 that it must be accompanied by a statement of case. Rule 46. We're talking about rule 46 of CI system. Yes. That it must be accompanied by a statement of case. And my Lord, we accordingly complied. My Lord, our second objection regards the nature of the reliefs sought by the plaintiff. It has nothing to do with Article 99, Clause 1 of the 1992 Constitution. It was a plain and simple case of invocation of the original jurisdiction of this court for interpretation of Article 70, Article 97, Clause 1, G and H. And my Lord, we have painstakingly stated this in paragraph 10 of our affidavit in opposition, as well as 11. My Lord, our third ground of opposition is contained in paragraph 13 of our affidavit in opposition, where we insist that the service of our writ 
and the motion on notice for interlocutory injunction on the Speaker of Parliament through the legal office of Parliament. Was good service. Was good service. Despite the fact that it was left on the table of the officer who received the processes. This was a day before the ruling of the Speaker of Parliament. It was done on the 16th of October 2024. And the Speaker went ahead to deliver his ruling on the 17th of October 2024. So our humble contention is that at the material time incidental to the delivery of the ruling, the speaker was fixed with knowledge of the pendency of the action before this honorable court. Yet he went ahead in this regard. My Lord, our fourth ground can be found at paragraphs 18 and 19 of our affidavit in opposition. Where again we've taken the pain to state that the order of this honorable court on the 18th of October 2024 granting a stay of execution against the ruling of the Speaker of Parliament does not amount to any interference with the procedures and business of Parliament. May Lord spare Article 2, Clause 1 of the 1992 Constitution. An invocation of the exclusive original jurisdiction of this APS court is the right of every citizen of Ghana. More so when the applicant in this instance is the majority leader and the leader of the majority caucus in parliament. He had an inherent interest in the said decision of the Speaker of Parliament, and for that matter, had every right, my Lord, to seek justice from this August Forum. But you know that under Article 2 actions, you don't even need to have an interest. Exactly. Your community of interest is with the Constitution of God. Exactly. So, my Lord, the point we seek to make. Because this point that you are making, I, I, I don't think it well. adds anything to this. Very well. So, Lord, we say that, guided by the Constitution, he need not show any interest. But even so, he had an interest. Lord, this is further fortified by Article 132 of the 19... 92 Constitution, which vests this honorable court with authority, with supervisory jurisdiction over any adjudicating authority, any adjudicating authority in Ghana regardless of being a separate arm of government. Lord, our faith ground is contained in paragraph 21 and 22 of our affidavit in opposition. giving our justification 
for resorting to an ex parte application. Paragraphs. Paragraph 21 and 22 of our affidavit in opposition. My Lord, we have stated therein that we could anticipate potential irreparable damage and mischief if the order was allowed to stay. And this action was to commence in the ordinary way. My Lord, we fortified our submission by relying on order 25 to 8 of CI 47. Lord, they said under 25 rule 8 identifies yes, of CIF 47. The point we seek to make, the point we seek to make is that, my Lord, one, one eight, very well, very well, Lord, I'm one eight, very well. My Lord, and just for the record, read it. <coughs> You don't have CI forty seven there, then can you move on? We've, we've, we've helped you by telling you order 25 rule 18, yes. not 25 8. So you can move on. Please. Your time is up. Lord, what we intend saying over there is that there was an element of agency. There was an element of agency associated with the application and the need for a dispatch response. Moreover, any mischief achieved by the ruling of the speaker was irreparable, considering the fact that those four constituencies would have been bereft of representation in Parliament between now and its dissolution. Five of CI system. This honorable court is the only court of the land seized with the power, seized with the power to prescribe rules of practice 
and procedure. So regardless of the fact that granting an expert application for limited number of days is not stated in the rules of the Supreme Court, my Lord, the court was all the same, vested with the power to make the order it made. And nothing, and nothing unlawful, unprocedural could be raised in respect of the order of the court. More so, my Lord, Article 2, Clause 2 of the 1992 Constitution gave this honorable power, this honorable court, the power to make appropriate directions that it may consider appropriate for giving effect or enabling effect to a declaration. My Lord, we are saying that in so long as those affected members of parliament were not given the opportunity to state their side of the story before the speaker made his order, the rules of natural justice, the only or Trump pattern was breached. This was a statement made by a member on the floor of parliament. This was a statement made I, by... I think you're going too far. Lord Amrandir. This was a statement made by... I think you're going too far. Very well. We can only limit ourselves to what is before us. My Lord, the capacity of the plaintiff is questioned. You have, you have responded to that. Yes, you, 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 very well. You said... Um, with a, if, if you don't mind, I can read what you said. Very well. I can read what you said. Um, the invocation of the jurisdiction of this court is the constitutional right of any citizen. Very well. Best one to Article 2. My Lord, in that circumstance, then I crave your indulgence to round off my argument. So you are done? Yes, I'm rounding Thank off. Thank you. That my Lord all said and done. All said and done. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, all said and done. There are many people here who are not here because of this case. I know. Their work needs to get done. Yes, I'm sorry. All said and done. It is the standpoint of the plenty respondent in this case that... He has not breached any procedure in seeking the order which is now being sought to be set aside. Neither is his action in breach of any substantive law or the constitution governing the republic. But granted without admission that there was even one. Rule 79 and order 81. <coughs> no, rule 79 of CI 16. And, and order 81 of CI 47. My Lord, makes it curable by this honorable court. Lord, I rest my case. I'm grateful. And Obrain Kwesata versus Ghana Telecom is not far fetched on this call. The decision of the court can be made. This application completely validates the laid down procedure for challenging a decision of the court. 
in the constitution. Article 133, clause 1. 133, clause 1. Of the constitution, first the Supreme Court with power to, and I quote, review any decision made or given by it on such grounds and subject to such conditions as may be prescribed by rules of court. Respectfully, the instant application seeks an order setting aside the process and proceedings of the court and vacating the law of the court. Respectfully, the decision in question was an exercise of right. As if you want to trade plus one, the review. That is review. One three three. I'm sorry. One three three. The review is on the court. Respectfully, my contention is that this provision is a rule under which a person aggrieved by a decision of the court comes by to seek a review of variation of the of the decision. The instant application is not an application for review. It doesn't invoke the court's review powers and is therefore unknown to the laws governing the judicial of the court. Especially Article 134 also vests the Supreme Court with the same powers of review of a decision of a single justice. <coughs> Indeed, the decision in question was not by a single justice. But the point I seek to make is that whenever a decision of the court is being sought to be reviewed, varied, or discharged, the procedure for doing so is as set out in the Constitution. And this is not in the vocation of any of, the, of those procedures. The second point we make is that the application makes it up grounds for a substantive defense to the action. with matters that, in the view of the first defendant, constitutes a basis for a certain aside of the service. And this respectfully is wrong. The court will notice that, on the face of the motion paper, the grounds for the application are stated as, and I respectfully I'll put, I'll just be quick about it, the rate by which the plaintiff has reportedly invoked the court's original jurisdiction is incompetent. The court has no jurisdiction to detain the suit before the court. The court has no jurisdiction to stay in speech of a ruling of the Speaker of the Parliament of Ghana. Respectfully, paragraphs 12 to 18 of the affidavit in support also raise matters which constitute a substantive defense to the action. And I respectfully will quote Paragraph 2 of so the words used in Article 97, Clause 1, paragraphs J and H of the Constitution are clear, unambiguous, and have no undisputed, have no disputed meaning, and no basis exists in the processes far for assuming that this is true. Then, paragraph 13, is that the words used in the provisions of Article 97, Clause 1, paragraphs J and H simply mean what they say. That is to say, every member of parliament leaves a party on the ticket of which they are elected to parliament to join a political party or to become an independent member of parliament or when a member of parliament elected as an independent member of parliament joins a political party, they shall vacate their seat. Respectfully, I will turn over to paragraph 29 to 32 of the affidavit in support. And again, they constitute substantive defenses to the action. I'm not going to tell you, General. You know you have 10 minutes. Yes, please. My, my lady, I'm so well within the term. I'm sorry. So, it says, paragraph 31, further, the 19th Constitution of the Republic of Ghana provides for the world known separation of powers doctrine, whereby the scope of the powers of each arm of government is set out, and no arm of government is set, is, is, is expected to accept it bounds. The same is repeated in other parts of the affidavit. So, the point I make respectfully is that when a defendant takes the view that the writ does not invoke the decision of the court because, in the view of the defendant, the words of the constitution are clear. The rules do not permit the filing of an application to set aside the race on that basis. Indeed, the grounds for 
such a contention will have to be in a statement of case filed at the point raised for determination by the court. And the court will notice that indeed that issue is actually one of the issues set out set out by the second defendant for determination. The second defendant does the attorney general file issues for determination in this matter, and those are issues raised in the for determination by the court. Respectfully, indeed, the application completely misunderstands and misconceives the Supreme Court's original judiciary. And I made the point that, indeed, the court would notice that Article 2, Clause 1 of the Constitution constitutes the principal mechanism, with all respect, for enforcing the, the Constitution. And in examining Article 2, Clause 1, I pray the court not to look only at the article, but to even read it with Article 3, Clause 1 of the Constitution. Article 3 of the Constitution, Article 3, the whole of Article 3 of the Constitution, imposes a duty on all citizens to defend the Constitution at all times. Respectfully, there is no better mechanism for defending the Constitution by seeking an interpretation of the Constitution whenever a provision of the Constitution is in contention or a controversy has arisen in respect of that provision. Clearly, the meaning of Article 97, Clause 1, Paragraphs J and H, as advanced by my late friend, Counsel for Defense Defendant, of which he says are clear, have been contradicted by the plaintiff in this case. And indeed, I have also duly filed a single of case in, in it. And totally, his understanding, with all respect, is wrong. There cannot be a more demonstrable case for a controversy as having arisen in respect of a provision of the Constitution than the instant case. But indeed, my respectful submission is that indeed it will be a recipe for chaos lawlessness, and a danger to the security of the state for a person to contend that merely on account of his own understanding of the constitution, which he says are clear, a writ issued duly invoking the judicial of the Supreme Court has to be set aside. And that would be the basis for lawless conduct. And this honorable court owes a duty not to encourage him. Maybe I'm fortified in this proposition by the locus classicus on the matter to four and attain Jura, reported in 1980, Ghana Report, at page 637. It where the Supreme Court stated clearly that whenever a controversy has arisen in respect of a provision of the Constitution, it is a basis for the implication of the cause of regeneration. Respectfully, the point I make today are not points being sought to be established today. They are matters that have been long established 40 years ago in this honorable court. My lady, I quote, at, I quote from page 650 of the provision. And indeed, it was also a controversy regarding a decision by Parliament. Parliament had actually made a decision to subject the Chief Justice of the Republic to vet. The Chief Justice had also even acceded to that process. The Supreme Court state said that, notwithstanding the Chief Justice decision, insofar as that decision was unconstitutional, it could form the side matter of the original decision of the, of the Supreme Court. But indeed, the court stated that there's a controversy regarding the status of the incumbent Chief Justice, the termination of which depends upon our interpretation of the Constitution. Once there's a controversy, a justiciable issue, we believe that under the wing of interpretation, as contained in paragraph A of clause 1 of Article 118, the court has reason to detain the issue raised by the plaintiff's rate, and the plaintiff is thus properly before the court. And respectfully, the court went ahead to make the point that in a constitutional action, the community of interest is with the constitution. There is even no such thing as a plaintiff and a defendant, and therefore um, the, the rate which mentioned some um, um, members of parliament there must be a demonstration of an interest in them. There's no certain as that. Indeed, the plaintiff, with all respect, could have omitted reference to any member of parliament and have just stated a question for the determination by the court 
whether upon a true, a true and proper interpretation of Article 97, Clause 1, paragraphs J and H of the Constitution, a, a seat of a member of parliament becomes vacant upon the occurrence of A and B. And that is it. And the court will have been seized with the decision. My lady, the first final makes reference to an alleged denial of the right to a hearing on the authority pattern by the filing of a motion as party. My respectful quick answer is that indeed <laughs> the law even envisages such a procedure and there cannot be a denial of any natural justice, right to natural justice in the court retaining an application for application as party. Already, if indeed it was the case that whenever a motion as party is brought, there is a denial of the right to a hearing, then indeed the court ought to scrap from its procedures and rules motions as party. This submission is totally incongruous, totally offensive to the long <coughs> or the age old practice in this honorable court. Res respectfully, I would respond to the contention made by my lay friend that there was an understanding of the CJ with the Speaker of Parliament and all that. I do not seek to even go into the merits of the understanding. But the no, point I, must be made that constitutionally. No, hold on, please. Right. I, I think that for the benefit of the public, public right. of this nation, right. it is important to address the facts behind that, one. that matter. Right. As we be. D. Because <coughs> there had been a circular in 2021 to regulate service of members of parliament. And indeed, the Speaker of Parliament invited me as Chief Justice to discuss the return to that regulation. So I reviewed what my predecessor did, and I issued a circular. If anything, I think your submissions may address the import, the oh, legal right. import, oh, and right. nothing more. Right. Maybe in addressing the legal import of, of that circular, I would note respectfully that for a circular that what is paramount before the court in an action of this nature is the proper interpretation of the constitution and indeed as held into foreign attention even if assuming with her admitting even if the cg had written such a letter for me with all respect it's immaterial a, a circular the circular written such a circular it is immaterial for me. It is a construction of the words in the constitution that matter. The full material even indicated that the chief justice who had lent himself to the process, which was subsequently pronounced upon as unconstitutional by, by, by the court, could not have waived any right whatsoever. Because there's no such thing as a super under the constitution. And I did I look at the provisions, the words in Article Articles 117 and 118. <coughs> All it says is that civil or criminal processes coming from any court or place as of parliament shall not be served on or executed in relation to the speaker or a member of the, of the, or the clerk of parliament while he is on his way to attending at or returning from any proceedings of parliament. In my respect with you, I do not see Monday in Article 112, 117. I do not see Monday there. I do not see Tuesdays to Friday. I do not see all that must be understood clearly. Irrespective of that secular, in my respectful view, I, the Atenjura, can, or any citizen of the land, having a vote of the, the Supreme Court, can serve the process on a member of parliament, a speaker of parliament, or a clerk to parliament, except when he's on his way to parliament or returning from parliament. That's what he says. <coughs> but really, again, there is an attempt to suggest, and it, is, it was implied in the submissions relating to 
the Supreme Court overstepping its bounds and what have you. That Parliament of Ghana, I, I know I have a right of reply, but it's here. It's down over 25 minutes. Yeah. Me the Attorney General, and you I'm have one, one minute left. But, but I have no other right to reply, especially that he got up only on points of law. So I will, I will, but, but he's exceeding. Please sit down. Yes. Maybe, yes, the point of law I made it because of application. Please, is please, please don't waste here. your one minute. Maybe I'm afraid. Maybe the point I'm making is that the Supreme Court's judicial review powers, first one to articles 2 cross 1 and 130 cross 1. <laughs> extend to any authority, institution of state, or any individual in the country. No arm of government, no institution of state, and definitely no individual is exempt from it. Indeed, the president himself is even subject to Supreme Court's judicial review powers under the constitution. And the constitution spells out the consequences for a failure to obey decisions and orders and directives of the Supreme Court. That is in Article 2, Clause 4. Failure to obey or carry out the terms of an order or direction made or given under Clause 2 of this article constitutes a high command under this constitution and shall, in the case of the president of the then constitute a ground for removal from office under this constitution. So we shall declare the powers of the court can never be questioned at all. And it is for this reason that the Supreme Court in to full and attain Jira, and further fortified by J.H. Mensah and Atenjua, reported in 1996, Supreme Court of Ghana law report, stated clearly that in Ghana, there's even no such thing as a political person. The court can call into question any act or omission of any person at all, insofar as it's in violation of the constitution. So the, 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 the contention by Malay Friend Council for Fair Defendants that it was an administrative decision of the, of the speaker, and so with all respect, I'll ask, and so what? Any administrative decision of a person or authority which comes in contravention of the constitution is amenable to the court's judicial review powers. I simply submit that the application before you is totally offensive to all rules and procedure of this honorable court. It's unknown to the laws of Ghana and must be dismissed. I pray accordingly. Elementary, first rule in the civil procedure class is that if an order is a nullity, you can come by any procedure to set it aside. He remains the law following from, that he, he likes to cite cases of vintage. He says over 40 years. She calculate when we'll say a marginal was, was, was decided, 1963. Mr. Sorry, all be, your juniors are here. And they were here when they say uh, they, uh, uh, there is a misconception and a misunderstanding. They have remained here. And this is the clearest example of a misconception and misunderstanding. I say from 1963, up to 2000s, and we are now in 2020 something. It remains the law, elementary first rule. Two, that I'm challenging the jurisdiction of the courts, and I'm saying, uh, with, with all due respect, some matters don't fall within the jurisdiction. Some matters do not. That, that this matter doesn't fall within the jurisdiction of the courts, mm -hmm. and that should, I'm mixing mm -hmm. a, 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 a matters that should go through the defense mm -hmm. and then an objection. Mm -hmm. Now, the rule. point made. Yes. Is that if you are urging that the writ is incompetent, yes. that should be separated yes. from submitting a defense to the substantive action. Okay. That's one. Yes. Second, that if this court gives an order and you wish for it to be vacated, reversed, varied, discharged, the onus is on you to bring an application under the review jurisdiction okay. of the court okay. and not an application such as you have crafted. Yes, ma'am. That's the point. And I'm saying that the trite principle of civil procedure is that the rules of review aside, this court delivers judgment according to three main yardsticks, statute law, common law, and the well-known practice of the courts. That has been consistent. And the well-known practice of the court and the common law is that you come and set it aside. And I'm saying way back from the I mean, up to date, that remains the law. So this is not a, a point. Secondly, if I am challenging the jurisdiction of the court, there are two ways and several ways, elementary civil procedure. I can take it in limine or put it in my defense. And I'm taking it in limine. Another elementary point. Now, let me just deal with the Article 2.1 point, Tendrously said, in all of the cases 
involving Article 99, the jurisdiction of the court to determine a membership of parliament. They also come under Article 21, but the court has always said that yes, if they didn't invoke Article 21, they wouldn't have been here. But the court has said, look, we will keep our streams clear. Then you cite to for an attorney general and uh, about the fact that the matter is within. Your one minute is up. <laughs> well, there are other cases. Maybe I can say I more fatigue, but more of the recent vintage, they all say clearly that that would not be a reason for the court to entertain jurisdiction. And as for the secular, the, 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 my Lord, the, my Lord, the Chief Justice must have had reason to issue it, and the Speaker must have had reason to respect it. And, and if it has constitutional power. If it's not constitutional, he knows what to do. He should come and declare it unconstitutional. But otherwise, then the Speaker should feel deceived by it. That's the point. You are done. I'm done. But if my time was up, then. The case is stood down for the court to rule. All rise.
This is the Mr. Martin. I didn't see. Did you stand? Did the party stand? I didn't see them. And council, council present, right? The same representation. the ruling of the court. The Speaker of Parliament, as first defendant in this suit and applicant in this application, is praying this court for an order setting aside the processes and proceedings of the plaintiff's suit filed on 15th October 2024 and vacating an order made by this court on 18th October 2024. On 18th October 2024, this court had an application for stay of execution of a ruling of the applicant declaring four seats in Parliament vacant on 17th October 2024. The application urged that the effect of this ruling is that the said members of Parliament for the four constituencies in Western, Eastern, Central and Ashanti regions were declared to have vacated their seats by the Speaker of Parliament. And if the Speaker's ruling is enforced, the affected members of Parliament would have had to leave Parliament and all their duties and responsibilities entrusted to them by reason of their being members of Parliament from the 18th October 2024. These members of parliament are namely Honorable Cynthia Mamle Morrison, Member of Parliament for Aguna West constituency in the Central Region, Honorable Andrew Esiama Mwaku, MP for Formena constituency in the Ashanti Region, Honorable Kwejo Asante, Member of Parliament for Suhum constituency in the Eastern Region, and Honorable Peter Yaokwachi Aka. Member of Parliament for Amenfi Central in the Western Region. Eight grounds have been presented to us in today's application. The submissions made in support of them can be summarized as follows. One, that the Constitution and laws of Ghana provide no grounds to allow the actions of the Speaker of Parliament while presiding over Parliament to be questioned in any court, including the Supreme Court, because of the doctrine of separation of powers that guide, guides Ghana's constitutional democracy. Two, that because of a circular issued by the Chief Justice of Ghana in 2021 and repeated by another circular issued by the current Chief Justice under the hand of the Judicial Secretary, the service of the processes in this suit on the Speaker of Parliament was invalid. As such, the Speaker of Parliament, under the hand of the Clerk of Parliament, had returned court processes served. That whenever there is a vacation of parliamentary seat, and this is identified by Parliament in its proceedings, the only lawful forum for disputing any issue concerning the vacation of seat is the High Court as provided for in Article 99 of the 1992 Constitution. The applicant urges that no jurisdiction is given to the Supreme Court in such a situation. Four, because the orders of 18 October 2024 were made after hearing only one party in the suit, and without hearing the Speaker of Parliament, the orders breached the rules of natural justice, breached the rules for exercising discretion provided for under Article 296 of the 1992 Constitution, and were invalid. 
5, the orders of 18th October 2024 were made on the basis of fraudulent misrepresentations by the applicant to the court. 6. The substantive action is incompetent because the rate was accompanied by a statement of claim and without an affidavit or verification. The application is opposed by the plaintiff, who is himself a member of parliament, and the attorney general, who is a second defendant. We have considered the application. Sorry, it's opposed by the first defendant. Sorry. By the plaintiff. Yeah. And we tired. <laughs> we have considered the application and find that the grounds supporting the application have no merit because of the very explicit and clear directions of the 1992 Constitution, specifically Article 2, Article 130, and Article 296, and established decisions of the Supreme Court from decades of the country's constitutional history. Below are the reasons behind our evaluation that the application has no merit. Interpretation and enforcement jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Article 2, on the very first page of the 1992 Constitution, provides as follows. Enforcement of the Constitution. A person who alleges that A, an enactment or anything contained in or done under the authority of that or any other enactment, or any act or omission of any person that's B is inconsistent with or is in contravention of a provision of this constitution may bring an action in the Supreme Court for a declaration to that effect. Two, the Supreme Court shall, for the purposes of a declaration under clause one of this article, make such orders and give such directions as it may consider appropriate for giving effect or enabling effect to be given to the declaration so made. Three, any person or group of persons to whom an order or direction is addressed under, article, under clause two of this article by the Supreme Court shall duly obey and carry out the terms of the order or direction. Four, failure to obey or carry out the terms of an order or direction made or given under clause 2 of this article constitutes a high crime under this constitution and shall, in the case of the president or the vice president, constitute a ground for removal from office under this constitution. Five, a person convicted of a high crime under clause 4 of this article shall be shall a be liable to imprisonment not exceeding 10 years without the option of a fine and b not be eligible for election or for appointment to any public office for 10 years beginning with the date of the expiration of the term of imprisonment from the above it, is, it can be seen from the very first page of the 1992 Constitution that the most fundamental and hallowed right of every Ghanaian that the 1992 Constitution gives and jealously guards is that when anyone, including the President and Vice President, is embarking on an act, on any act that violates any provision of the Constitution, or if anyone is of the considered opinion that any law or rule enacted by any legislative body breaches the Constitution, that person can run to the Supreme Court for enforcement of the Constitution. That person does not even need to be directly affected by that act or law. This Supreme Court regularly exercises this original and exclusive jurisdiction for citizens of this country. Second, Article 130 provides, 131, 
subject to the jurisdiction of the High Court in the enforcement of the fundamental human rights and freedoms as provided in Article 33 of this Constitution, the Supreme Court shall have exclusive original jurisdiction and in A, all matters relating to the enforcement or interpretation of this Constitution. All matters arising to as to whether an enactment was made in excess of the powers conferred on Parliament or any other authority or persons by law or under this Constitution. Where an issue that relates to, where an issue that relates to matter or question referred to in clause 1 of this article arises in any proceedings in a court other than the Supreme Court, that court shall stay the proceedings and refer the question of law involved to the Supreme Court for determination. And the court in which the question arose shall dispose of the case in accordance with the decision of the Supreme Court. This means that if anyone feel, finds, finds that a meaning is being given to any provision of the 1992 Constitution that the person disputes, or that any act is being done by reason of a disputed meaning given to the Constitution, then Article 2 and Article 131A mandates that only the Supreme Court has jurisdiction to provide the people of Ghana with a correct interpretation of the provision in the Constitution. Third, it is the most basic tenet of our legal system that different courts operate in different jurisdictions, and every court is given its own jurisdiction. So the type of cases that can be settled in any court depends on the nature of the dispute. <coughs> Thus, if someone is challenging that a member of parliament has not lawfully won their seat, that challenge must be done at the high court in the region that the constituency is in. However, if any two people challenge that the process of electing the same member of parliament did not conform with the constitutional provision, that dispute over the correct interpretation or meaning of the constitutional provision must be brought to the Supreme Court for interpretation. Indeed, if the dispute over correct interpretation or meaning of the relevant provision occurs while the parties are before the High Court, the High Court must, by direction of Article 132, stop hearing the case and refer the dispute over the correct interpretation of the Constitution to the Supreme Court. There are many cases on this manner of resolving disputes requiring constitutional interpretation, including ex parte Zanotto Rollins citation provided. In every given month and year, the Supreme Court regularly deals with cases seeking interpretation and enforcement of provisions of the 1992 Constitution. And every law report issued every month is filled with such cases. It is therefore misinformation and misapprehension of law for the applicant to present that the Supreme Court has no jurisdiction to provide the correct interpretation of Article 971G because Article 99 gives jurisdiction over determination of membership of Parliament to the High Court. Article 99 reads, the High Court shall have jurisdiction to hear and determine whether a, a person has been validly elected as a member of Parliament or the seat of a, mem of a member has become vacant, or a person has been validly elected as a Speaker of Parliament, or having been so elected has vacated the office of Speaker. A person aggrieved by the determination of the High Court under this article may appeal to the Court of Appeal. From the above, it can be seen that if anyone raised the question whether a person has been validly elected as a member of Parliament, or a seat of a member of parliament has become vacant as a matter of fact, that person is required to go to the high court for the high court to resolve any issues around that question.
In the instant case, the records brought to the Supreme Court submitted that the question was raised on the floor of Parliament that by filing nominations to contest as independent members of the Ninth Parliament, members of the Eighth Parliament should be deemed by reason of the meaning of Article 971G to have vacated their seats in the Eighth Parliament. Thus, the vacation of seats is not a matter of fact from death or resignation or notice by the parties themselves to Parliament. It is to be taken from an interpretation and enforcement of Article 971G. It has been argued by counsel for the Speaker that what the Speaker presented to Parliament on 17th October did not constitute a ruling that was executable or amenable to the controversy raised in the suit. On the contrary, we find that nothing can be clearer in the record from Parliament that was brought to this court and considered before this court's ruling of 18th October 2024 that this was an executable ruling. The Speaker's ruling is headed quote, formal communication by the speaker. It set out the background of issues he was considering and covers 10 pages of evaluation of law and fact. He concluded by declaring that, quote, the MPs cannot be allowed by law and my good self to continue to pretend to be representing people that they do not believe in and have no loyalty for in this house any longer. The house is accordingly informed, unquote. These are words that affect the rights of these MPs to remain in parliament and the rights of their constituents to their representation. Thus, if a controversy is raised to the propriety of the interpretation of Article 971G, that led to this conclusion, then this court is rightly sized with jurisdiction to provide a hearing to the plaintiff. According to the plaintiff, the speaker's interpretation of Article 971G was wrong because he, the plaintiff, also interpreted Article 971G as affecting members of parliament who wanted to change party affiliation. He also interpreted it as affecting the status of parliamentarians in the next parliament and not while sitting in the eighth parliament. These and others are the disputed interpretations that the plaintiff presented to the Supreme Court to give the nation the correct meaning of. For the sake of the record, we set out Article 97, 97 1. A member of parliament shall vacate his seat in parliament upon a dissolution of parliament, or if he's elected as speaker of parliament, or if he's absent without permission in writing of the speaker, and he's unable to offer a reasonable explanation to the parliamentary committee on privileges from 15 settings of a meeting of parliament during any period that parliament has been summoned to meet and continues to meet. Or, D, if he's expelled from Parliament after having been found guilty of contempt of Parliament by a committee of Parliament, or if, or E, if any circumstances arise such that if he were not a member of Parliament would cause him to be disqualified or ineligible for election under Article 94 of this Constitution, or F, if he resigns from office as a member of Parliament by writing under his hand, addressed to the speaker, or G, if he leaves the party of which he was a member at the time of his election to parliament to join another party or seeks to remain in parliament as an independent member, or H, if he was elected a member of parliament as an independent candidate and joins a political party. Two, notwithstanding paragraph G of clause 1 of this article, a merger of parties at the national level sanctioned by the party's constitution or membership of a coalition government of which this of his of, of which his original or political party forms part shall not affect the status of any member of parliament. Now clearly, 
with the disputed interpretations alleged in the plaintiff's statement of case. Even if the parties had gone to the High Court under Article 99, the High Court would have been compelled by Article 132, as happened in the case of ex parte Zanetto Rollins, to refer these contested meanings to the Supreme Court to determine the correct interpretation. It is therefore disingenuous and wrong, including being an act of disinformation, for the argument to be presented that the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court could never be invoked to determine a constitutional interpretation because of the High Court's jurisdiction to hear and determine disputes on elections and vacation of seats of members of parliament under Article 99. Our clear view is that Article 99 gives the jurisdiction to hear cases involving questions on validity of election or vacation of seats of a member of parliament and the speaker. It does not in any way take away the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court to interpret and enforce any provision of the Constitution, including Article 99 itself. We have considered the objection to the procedure used to serve the Speaker because of the administrative circular of the, Supreme, of the Chief Justice in 2021 and 2024. We are satisfied that administrative procedures cannot override the potency of legality, and every procedure used by the Supreme Court to serve the processes of the Speaker of Parliament were actually in conformity with law and the circulars issued by the Chief Justices in 2021 and 2024. Exercise of discretion. The Speaker of Parliament is urging that the Supreme Court breached the rules of natural justice and rules prescribing the manner for exercising discretion in the orders made on 18th October 2024. In hearing the application ex parte and granting orders to stay execution of the Speaker's ruling pending the resolution of the suit. It is a very basic and primary principle of law that an order of stay of execution must be made on consideration of exceptional circumstances that can affect the parties. Which exceptional circumstances include the wreaking of irreparable harm if an order of stay of execution is not granted? In the ruling of the Supreme Court on 18th October 2024, the Supreme Court was very clear that its orders were being made because of the exceptional circumstances that would flow from the effect of the ruling of the Speaker of Parliament declaring the four seats vacant and a determination not to allow the MPs to remain in Parliament. What are some of the effects that weighed on our minds as exceptional circumstances that were alluded to in the ruling? The four constituencies of Amenfi Central, Formina, Aguna West, and Suhum in the Western Region, Ashanti Region, Central Region and Eastern Regions of Parliament are made up of hundreds of thousands of Ghanaians who had queued to elect these members of Parliament to represent their interests in Parliament as their voices. By declaring that their duly elected representatives in Parliament had vacated their seats for acts that were interpreted within the light of Article 971G by the Speaker, the Speaker was actually enforcing this interpretation of Article 971G against those hundreds of thousands of Ghanaians, and not just the four people that sit in Parliament. He was also doing so at a time that from the official records in, in, of Parliament presented to the Supreme Court, the Speaker knew that a contrary interpretation was being placed on the same constitutional provision and that the Supreme Court's jurisdiction had been invoked to provide the correct interpretation. By reason of law, there could be no by-election to replace these elected representatives between 17th October 2024 and 7th January 2025. So, 7th January 2025. 2025. Mm. So these Ghanaians 
would have been left without a voice and representation in parliament from, parliament from 18th October 2024 until 7 January 2025, when the ninth parliament can be duly constituted in Ghana. This exceptional circumstance arising from the outcome of the ruling weighed on the mind of the Supreme Court to grant an order directing a stay of execution of the ruling of the Speaker on 17th October 2024. Second, the effect of this ruling would be that the salaries, allowances, and other emoluments of, the, of these members of Parliament would have had to stop being paid immediately. They would have had to vacate their offices in Parliament and cease functioning on any committee of parliament that they were serving on. If any of them was a minister or deputy minister and had been appointed as such by reason of being members of parliament, the ruling that they had vacated their seats could have brought those duties to an immediate halt. Indeed, one of the four members of parliament is the current second deputy speaker of parliament. The Supreme Court was very clear that these outcomes that could cause irreparable harm to the constituencies in issue and the MPs themselves constituted exceptional circumstances to warrant a halt of the ruling of, of the Speaker until the controversy raised had been resolved. The consideration of these exceptional circumstances was clearly spelt out in the ruling of 18th October 2024. So it is surprising that the applicant should urge that the discretion of the Supreme Court was exercised in breach of Article 296. So why did the Supreme Court grant orders after hearing this application ex parte or without notice to the Speaker of Parliament? Once again, the ruling stated the reason clearly. The official records of Parliament for 17th October 2024 was placed before the Supreme Court as an exhibit. The record showed that the processes of court had been set through the legal department of Parliament, and this had been brought to the notice of the Speaker. He banted extensively on this information with the plaintiff on the floor of Parliament. And the Speaker's only reason for choosing to quarrel with the summons from the Supreme Court, an application for injunction to restrain him from ruling on a matter premised on interpretation of Article 97.1G, was that as Speaker, he was only supposed to be served with court processes on Monday. This is an unfortunate interpretation of the first column of the circular referred to, because this circular provides for the Speaker of Parliament to be served personally on Mondays and through the legal department of Parliament on any day. But whatever interpretation of the secular that the Speaker chose to put on how he was to be served, the Supreme Court is satisfied that the Speaker was well served with notice of the action that had been started on 15th October 2024 and seeking the correct interpretation of Article 971G of the Constitution. He was well served before he delivered his ruling on 17th October 2024 that, led, that would lead to the exceptional circumstances enumerated herein. And the Supreme Court carries the constitutional obligation to give the correct interpretation of Article 971G for its enforcement, if need be, by the High Court or any person that the interpretation comes to. Hence, the scope of the orders made to stay as enforcement of the Speaker's interpretation of Article 971G. Grants of orders beyond 10 days. The speaker's lawyer urges that because of order 25 rule 18 of the High Court Civil Procedure Rules 2004 CI 47 that enjoins high courts to grant injunctions and other preservation orders for 10 days in the first instance if head as party 
and without notice to one party summoned before the court. The Supreme Court was also enjoined to grant the ex parte order for 10 days as a matter of rules and practice. This is a submission that fails to appreciate the import of Article 2.2 and 2.3 and 2.4, which guide the Supreme Court when dealing with a constitutional matter such as this. We will quote again Articles 2.2, 2, 2.3 and 2.4. The Supreme Court shall, for the purposes of a declaration under Clause 1 of this article, make such orders and give such directions as it may consider appropriate for giving effect or enabling effect to be given to declarations so made. Any person or group of persons to whom an order or direction is addressed under clause 2 of this article by the Supreme Court shall duly obey and carry out the terms of the order or direction. The Constitution enjoins the Supreme Court to make orders that are appropriate for giving effect or enabling effect to be given to its final declarations on the correct meaning of a constitutional provision. And the Constitution is so serious about ensuring the obedience of such orders that it creates the offense of high crime for failure to obey such orders in Article 2.4. Not even the President and Vice President are exempt from obeying the orders of the Supreme Court when they are made to give effect to its duty to prevent a violation of the Constitution. Because of the irreparable harm to the constituencies made up of hundreds of thousands of Ghanaians who would have lost their MPs without the option of a by-election, and the irreparable harm to the MPs who would have lost their seats in Parliament in these last few weeks to the 7th December elections, if the meaning put on Article 971G by the Speaker was enforced without a clear determination of the dispute around it, this court found it expedient to compel the parties to allow an early hearing rather than make an order that would last only 10 days. This is the reason for the Supreme Court's order, orders abridging the 14 days allowed for defending a constitutional action through a statement of case and directing the parties to file their respective statements of cases within seven days and present the issues for resolution immediately thereafter. If the parties had complied with the court's orders, this would have taken all of the 10 days the applicant urges an ex parte order ought to last. Compliance would also have enabled this court to dispose of this case by this week, including the question of whether the suit is competent in form or the jurisdiction of this court has been properly invoked or invoked. It is important, and the, and the question of whether the jurisdiction has been properly invoked is different from whether the jurisdiction exists. It's a different legal question. It is important to place on record that both the plaintiff and the attorney general have complied with these orders, and this court is able to complete hearing of this suit if the speaker chooses to file no processes. For the above reasons, the application is refused. Lord, we, are. Lord, we are extremely grateful. Ask the court, please, this morning. So, Mr. So yes. Lord, we're grateful. So, Mr. Sorry, will you be filing anything? Or should we hear without you? Oh, no. I, I, I don't have instructions on that matter. But especially so that if my lady looks at uh, the affidavit that I filed, I said the order was served on the speaker on Monday. So he has seven days. I will speak with him, draw the, uh, his attention to the court's ruling. And then. That, so it was served on him. On, the order was served on him on Monday. That's Monday. Monday was 29th? No, last Monday is the 20th. Is it Monday just around two weeks ago? No, no, wait, wait, wait. No. On the 20th. It was served on the 20th. On the 20th? No, and 21st, today is the 21st. 21st. It was twenty first. So he's gone past the seven days. No, but if he served with the order on that specific day, telling him to file within seven days, it takes effect on the date of service. That's my understanding. So he was supposed to file by twenty eighth. No, uh, by the rules of the court, where the time limited for doing something is seven days or less, weekends. Are so he was supposed to file by when? Um, if we take out. No. 
Today. Today. Today? Yes. This youth is adjourned to Friday for completion. File your processes by close of day tomorrow. Malika. This is a constitutional crisis. Uh, we are living in a country where the parliament is not sitting. What is going on? I, I'm not too sure that this suit is to enable parliament sit, is to declare. Very well. Yes, I, so. I take it then. that. That's really in so, your yes, So if I would plead that because this, is, look at the time that we are closing and the fact that we've done some work, filing it by Friday is not, uh, it's not possible. I, I also need to still go and take instructions. So maybe next week is, 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 is fair. Today is Wednesday. Next week, At least if I'll take if I'll take if I'll take seven days to file the two. No, do, do not count your seven days from today. Your seven days started running from twenty first. You I'm cannot not make days. your own. Rules. I'm just praying the court. I'm not making rules. I'm just praying the court. <laughs> So you, so you will file by what date? No, no. Party, as a party was an interest in the matter, apart from the entire state. And respectfully, it is not for nothing that the constitution makes the attorney general the defendant in all actions involving the government, an arm of which is parliament. Respectfully, my submission is that and the if in the constitution. And the, and the constitution, yes. in all constitutional actions, the attorney general is required to be, to be a party. Yes, we are party. And so the, the point I make is that, indeed, the reluctance, with all respect, by the, of the can, first defendant. Can, can we get to know the objective? Right. That first and foremost, if the first defendant is unwilling, with all respect, to file processes to enable the court to complete the case by Friday, my submission is that the first finance is not even a proper party to the proceedings before the court. And this absence will not derogate from the court's ability to proceed with the hearing of the matter. Because he, the first finance, has no personal interest in the proceedings before the court. Indeed, it is even improper for the first finance to have been joined to the action. The proper defendant should have been only the attorney general. The second submission I make is actually linked with the first. Especially if a party who is a public officer is joined to a constitutional action involving the attorney general, that party, if the court allows it, will have to procure services lawfully. My submission is that if we counsel for the first defendant, has not been lawfully procured. He has no lawful mandate to represent the first finance. The procurement of all goods, works, and services under in this republic must be in compliance with the Public Procurement Act. Section 14, subsection 1, requires the procurement of, even the attainder, with all respect, even the attainder, when the attainder is procuring service of a lawyer, the, the procurement goes to PPA, approval. Even the attorney general, when for transfers of a lawyer to represent the country outside the Republic of Ghana in a high court in, say, London or New York, will have to be subject to, to PPA approval. My reserve submission is that the first finance council, I have tolerated him for no, and now he's even seeking to use the fact that he, had, he doesn't have instructions of the speaker to continue as the excuse to delay proceedings. So I made the point that one, the joint of the speaker is not even proper to the action. He is not required to be a party whose failure to file proceedings to hold up the court. Number two, counsel for the first finance has no lawful mandate to represent the Speaker of Parliament because the Speaker of Parliament is subject to the provisions of the PPA Act and indeed he must have procured a service of the PPA. He must have procured a service of the first finance counsel 
by the prior approval of the Public Procurement Authority. And therefore, his representation of the first finance is unlawful with all respect. And especially if indeed this, this, is, this, is the, this is what will lead to a further or a continuation of a constitutional crisis which the nation is subjected to. And my respectful submission is that the first finance should either be struck out as a defendant and then also his counsel cannot even represent him, but he's not, he doesn't have any lawful mandate to do so. My, my Lord, with all due respect, because some of the matters are not, are not even. But that uh, if the court is minded to give my learning friend time to file, of course, reminded of the fact that, first of all, Parliament seems to be in limbo, and secondly, also, they have received in their motion that they filed, they argued substantive issues. They are fully seized with the matter. They have answered, argued most of the matters. So perhaps if it could be very short so that we can come and be heard and then continue. My Lord, they are preaching to the converted. The minute you started speaking, I became converted. I totally agree with you. <laughs> oh. And process, other processes in this suit, this is Mr. Sorry, in this suit were served on the first defendant on the 21st of October. Yeah. Is, the order, is the order in the proceedings of the court? The order in the proceedings, the of, proceedings the of the court. And other processes, haven't they? No, haven't that was uh, 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 my instructions are that he returned the processes that were served on the separate mm -hmm. paper. Mm -hmm. No, there are two things the order itself. Uh, very well. The okay, very order well. and proceedings were served on. 21st. On the Speaker of Parliament on the 21st of October. We are confident of filing any process required by 6th November 2024. Yes, yes, my lady. By court, all processes currently filed are adopted for consideration by the court. First defendant is given up to 6th November 2024 to file his submissions in the statement of case and any memorandum of issues he identifies as arising from his case and that of the other parties. The most, most suit is adjourned to 11th of, October, of November for judgment. My Lord, with respect, we want to seek the leave of the court to file an amendment to our writ and our statement of case, not as to substance, for there are typos and there are the release being sought. That list. A declaration, the release being sought. One, a declaration that upon the true and proper interpretation of the 1992 Constitution should be of Article 971 G and H of the 1992 Constitution. Mr. Gatti, hold on. Why you look at Mr. Gatti, hold on. Which of the reliefs is a one, two, three, or four? Oh, sorry. I'm looking. The, I didn't hear it. Sorry. Relief one? Yes, I'm saying that a declaration that upon the true and proper interpretation of the 1992 Constitution, upon the true and proper interpretation, it should have read articles 971 G and H. And if you look at the body of the 97 1 G and H. You, so you want to add article 97, 97 one, one H. G, no, 1G and H. And H. Right. I want to add that there. Right. You want to introduce H. No, yes. G yes. and H. Yes. And, yes. And, and also... Yes. Mr. Mr. Gatte, you have to take your time. 
You're not doing this thing as of right. We need to hear what you're saying and, 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 and capture it properly. Then your, your, your brothers will have to also have, the, thank have, you. To have their say. Thank you. Thank Please. Um, Well, Mr. Gatti, um, in the endorsement, you have 97 one gene already, right? One gene and H. No, you have one gene here already. And H, yeah. But what I mean is that you have one gene here before us in the, in, in, in the original endorsement. In, my, in our original endorsement, you know, we have, if we start, the nature of this sort as follows. A declaration that upon the true and proper interpretation of the 1992 constitution, it doesn't state the articles that are being interpreted, even though in the body of everything that has been filed, we refer to 1971G so and H. Yes. And H. Yes. Then my, then my Lord. In the statement of the plaintiff's case, six point three on page eighteen. Page eighteen on statement of case. Paragraph six point eight. Meanwhile, Page 18 has seven. It starts with paragraph six seven. And that was statement of case. Yes, you know case, yes. He's plenty. It starts with six two in the, in such circumstances. Eight, one eight. Is this eight or eight? Ah, it's eight. It's eight. <laughs> Thank you. It's slash eight. Thank you. Six point three. Meanwhile, the literal interpretation of Article ninety seven one to ninety seven one G and H. Yes. Yes. But, my Lord, indeed, it appears all through. So, if I could say generally that everywhere where we state Article 97 1, we should add G and H. Rather than to take you to this laborious. Me, this means, Mr. Bugatti, that you do not want the court to consider any of the other provisions of Article 97.1. You are limiting yourself to 97.1 G and H. My Lord, that is what the controversy is about. That's what the controversy is about. So if we just see the Article 97.1, we're wasting the first time and go to town asking for advisory opinions and so on. The controversy is about one G. You have answered the question. Yeah. We should address 971 G and H. Yes. Okay. And yes. presume yes. you are 971 G as including H. My Lord, you have taken the words of our mouth. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Is there anything else? You are done. Well, I, I, my Lord realized that. My Lady realized that this amendment arose out of the arguments that took place earlier. When I was but actually talking as if H was part of all it. Well, so far as we were concerned, we were addressing only G. Everyone. Because that's what was in. Yes. You were addressing H, but I didn't understand where you got it from. Yeah, because, because you, what had been given to us was G. Was G. No, so what I said, what I said in my submission was that. 
they kept they only mentioned G, but they never mentioned H. But we we're all proceeding as if it was there. And that was what I was telling you. You may have been proceeding, but we well. were dealing with G. Well, well, well. My Lord, actually, having the rules, he's entitled to amend. It's just that uh, because of the agency of the yeah. circumstances. Otherwise, I would have taken the point very seriously. H is very much part of the controversy, and my submissions actually alluded to H as well. My lady, then also, of course, my lady, I'm always inclined for an expeditious determination. My lady, but the court would note that Rule 53 of CI 16, with all respect, makes provision for a hearing of the, of the matter. My, lady, so my respectful view of submission is that if the plaintiff, the first defendant, will be given the opportunity of filing his case by 6 November, my lady, really, there will be nothing wrong with all respect if we come for a hearing on the 7th. Unless 7th is not convenient to the court. And then the date for that man can still stand. I think that in a matter of movement as this, in a matter where the public is really interested in it and all the cameras are, with all respect, it will be a little bit. Um, if I may hesitantly use the word in Congress, for us to just adjust straight away for judgment without a, a hearing, especially when same is enjoined by the rules. Thank, Thank you, Attorney you General. Much. So you will address us on the on the seventh uh, on, no, on the eleventh, yes. okay. and then we will adjourn for some hours for judgment Very because well. we would have had the opportunity of considering of considering the well. all that had been found. Very well, respectfully. So Thank you very much. Officers, cross purposes, they can hide different laws. Nope, that's, that's not. It is where the interest of the persons conflict with the, that of the attorney. In this case, as I said, in a constitutional case, there's nothing like a person have an interest in it. Uh, why, what, what interest does the Speaker of Parliament have in the interpretation of, of the Constitution? So there's no interest, no personal interest of the Speaker of Parliament. And that's the point I, I sought to make. That indeed, when it comes to constitutional actions, the most important interest is the true and proper interpretation of the relevant provision of the Constitution. And that is it. So it's not as if a person has a personal interest in it. And if that's the case, as I indicated in some cases that I cited, it is actually a proper interpretation of the Constitution by the Supreme Court that is, that is, that, that is most important. And no. Uh, so the, the other concern is that was it deliberate to left it that late in court to raise this issue? Because one would have thought would have been one of the first yeah, issues you would have raised when you got to court today. I mean, as I said, I mean, I've always um, tolerated um, um, the Speaker of Parliament and his representation, even though I know um, it's not lawful. And of course, it is not, you see, and the point must be made, it is not an attempt to um, prevent the Speaker from having representation. If the Speaker wants to have a lawyer, the Speaker must procure the lawyer lawfully. And then, as I said, the attorney general, even when he's seeking the service of a lawyer to represent the government in cases outside the country, in foreign courts, 
goes to PP approval all the time. Even the chief justice, the former chief justice, Eddie Ebua, who was, with all respect, using the services of Tadio Sorry, had to go to PP approval. And I know for a fact that he has not received any PP approval. And so he's in flagrant violation of the, of, of the provincial law. And, and that is what we, we sought to bring to attention to the court. It is not. Chief justice, so it is. Not mentioned it again. Well, that's up to the court. You know, I do not quarrel with the court at all when the court decides to either defer ruling or maybe decides not to rule on it. And of course, all rights are also reserved in us to take it up further. What? A breach of the PPA Act constitutes a crime. And my contention is that you cannot use a crime to defend a clear unconstitutional action by us. So indeed, you are engaged in an unconstitutional action and you are using, with all respect, um, the commission of a crime to further that unconstitutionality. That is wrong. The court, the court largely agreed with you today, but it said that it was going to give a ruling on the objections you raised in this ruling. It did not again raise those issues yes uh, yes i mean that that was the material um, omission of the court but of course as i said i do not usually quarrel with the court and i do not have any complaints at all substantially as you said my objections i mean the point where i appealed and the sense is that the objections of the um first defendant the speaker of parliament were without any basis whatsoever and i think it's very important to indicate that this country sometimes there's a lot of ignorance paraded as wisdom the situation where you have ignorance paraded as wisdom must stop there's a lot of deceit and, and misrepresentation of reality to, to the public you find all the points that have been made all the time i listen to me, me the radio quietly when this matter came i've never spoken at all and i see a lot of ignorance and, and mis mischief being perpetrated and, and being thrown in the eyes of the public and you've seen it I, I'm, I'm sure that's why the court took its time to deliver such a comprehensive ruling to educate the public properly and to prevent ignorance from being further paraded as wisdom in this country. Thank you very much. To decline or fail to file his defense and statement of case to be action. So now we are poised for a full hearing and determination of the matter. No more interlocutory or interim applications. Do you support the Attorney General's position about the inability of the Speaker to continue in this case because of the PPA uh, um, standoff that uh, agreed earlier? You see, um, as plaintiffs in the matter, we acted out of abundance of caution in that we sued the office of the Speaker. We did not sue the Speaker personally. Uh, my client, the majority leader, has no personal action against Right Honorable Aban Babi. Mm. It was his office and the conduct of some official matters, especially his ruling of some people who objected. Now, back to the ruling of this speaker or any other arm of government, agency of government. Speaker's legal team uh, have taken quite a strong position on this. Uh, they hold the view simply that the Supreme Court's jurisdiction was not triggered properly. And they sinned against the time-tested principles which have been laid out by the Supreme Court. Uh, those are arguments that did not find favor uh, with the Chief Justice. And the Chief Justice, in her ruling, did state that, uh, make reference to the fact that within the period, we also know that a by-election also cannot take place. Again, she made reference to the issues regarding 
the deputy speaker of parliament the second deputy speaker of parliament for instance where that also affected in terms of parliamentary leadership as well and so all in all the point that she made was to the effect that look article 2 of the constitution empowers the supreme court to interpret the constitution and whenever a person makes an allegation and they are obvious that the parties in the matter have rival meanings the court is the right forum for us to interpret that particular provision it made it made notice of the fact that during the discussions in parliament you recall the issue of service the court the chief just explained that that was an administrative direction that had come out so lawyers of the speaker of parliament have been given up to november 6 to file all their processes and statement of issues that will be relied on but the case itself has been adjourned to november 11 where the supreme court is expected to make its um, hearing and then eventually make its final judgment on the substantive matter on november 11. lordy rasari tv3 news supreme court